they got the big bulk of the claims taken care of up front, and then the guy at the end just rides it out. And I want to be that guy at the end, so I'm going to do everything at the beginning to be the guy at the end, which means whatever they give me is I'm going to try and do it as fast as I can with the best quality and the best customer service that I can. I try to be the best. And honestly, it's not that hard. I discovered that if I put in 10% more effort that I could, that I was going to be working more than about 80% of other adjusters. I was you know, if you're average, you're better than 50% of the people. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if you're slightly above average, then it's, start, you know, the numbers start to work yep. in your favor. You know, you really have to push it to get into the top five or 10%, but it's still, it's just a matter of thinking through your processes. It's a matter of always reaching for, for respect, friendliness, and kindness first when you're dealing with anybody and trying to keep your eye on the ball, which is volume. Hello, James. How's it going? Good. What kind of questions do we have today? Well, Chris Rawls says, asks, best ways to shorten various learning curves, construction for me specifically, but I'm sure exact made and other topics would be helpful as well. So I want to talk about construction. Construction. Because construction is super important, but it's also one of the things that I think that adjusters across the board, whether they're staff or independent, it's it's a weak point and on right. our side. And I think specifically, not necessarily, you know, how to build a house. Right, what goes into a house, like framing, you know, whatever. But how to, after the house is built, tear off parts of it and put those parts back on, new parts right. back on because they were damaged in some way, right? Well, I was going to write a um, thing about this, about construction, mm -hmm. and put it together, but I'm still working on it. You're still constructing it? Yes. Uh, yeah. The dad jokes go at the end. Okay, my bad. <laughs> All right, so how do you learn construction? Like, how, what are there any resources out there um, currently? And sort of is the answer. Yeah. So there are probably thousands of books. There are endless YouTube videos, right? There are in in almost any neighborhood in the country you can go find somebody working on a house so there's construction people you know nailing things into other things happening all the time it's all around us um even when you sit in your own house or your own apartment you can look around and see the things that have been constructed right um <clears throat> I, I would say generally speaking that we don't necessarily need to know exactly how many nails go into a 3,500 square foot house, the framing of it, how many linear feet of, you know, Romex or AC wire or whatever you call it. Um, what we do need to know is how to repair stuff and, and how to repair the same things when they're damaged by different things. Like if it's something is drywall is damaged by smoke versus if it's damaged by water right so we need to know how to do repairs like that how to how to handle paint what to how to you know mask off a room or or if it should be masked in and which way should it be masked right should you cover all everything up or should you just use blue tape everywhere or like how does it even work right so i think that the the that in order to learn construction i think it makes it a lot easier to narrow down the things that you have to learn right so you don't need to learn how to build a house right, right? it's helpful certainly and it's good knowledge to have but it's not going to be a common thing that you're going to have to deal with even if you are building a house you know a total loss right because you still have to deal with tearing the house down and there are ways to write total loss estimates where you don't you're not you know, putting how many nails are in the whole thing, right? right? Um, using the software, which will estimate the things that are already there and automatically calculate all that stuff. So there's there's a, a sort of a, a depth of knowledge that you need to have beyond which is a diminishing return. 
as far as a resource, that can, a, a good place to get started so you can have a general understanding mm-hmm. this isn't going to be your be-all, end-all. But um, the Home Depot has a home improvement book, like Home Improvement 1, 2, 3, I believe is what it is. It shows you how to build a wall. It shows you how to do some of these home improvement items. And you can get a good understanding of the basics of what it takes to put up a wall, to wire something, that sort of thing. So you can get an idea of it. That'll give you a general basis. I mean, I'm not saying that this is going to teach you everything you need, but there's photos and diagrams and things like that that kind of give you a good idea of what you're looking at. And especially for somebody who's new that's never been around construction, never touched it, anything like that. It's a good resource to get started with, but it's not going to take the place of probably what you're going to talk about next but i'm just throwing it out there so sure. just get that skim through it look at some things it's going to give you some really really good yeah. good information yeah <clears throat> there are there are not a whole lot of like a, insurance like restoration um how to's out there on construction right that i know i don't know that there really there are any because even when you go to like when i went to vale national back in the day it was, here's how a house is put together. It wasn't like, this is what a technician's gonna do when he cuts, the, cuts out that drywall and ceiling, what it, what it looks like when he does that. And what are they gonna do? How do, they, do you have to seal the whole ceiling? Do you repaint the wall? I mean, what do you, right. none of that, right? right. They just kind of like, they, they'll, they'll talk about it, but you know, seeing something, having your hands on it, I think is, is, a, is a better way to teach. Because even years into my career, there were certain things that I was doing wrong for a long time, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Like masking off a room the wrong way. And then somebody, some some file reviewer or some manager or somebody was like, why are you putting this on there instead of this? That's just the way I've always done it. Well, that's wrong. (laughs) Okay, right? So you kind of like, even if you are writing estimates and writing them wrong and they're not getting kicked back to you or correct, you're not being told that they're wrong, you're going to keep doing them that way and it's still not going to be right, right? So to narrow down the topics for construction, for learning construction, start with finished surfaces, right? And start at the top, right? So the, the very first thing I would, I would tell somebody to learn to do or to learn about and certainly could probably find some videos on YouTube is how to tear off and reinstall a composition shingle roof. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Right. Learn that. Like watch that. And it's not. It's super easy. It's not rocket science. But when you watch it happen and you watch, if you can find videos or find resources where they show what they do around flashing, like around chimneys, are they taking the flashing off? Are they leaving it on? Are they having to take off the siding in order to do something? You know, if there's a, a dormer or a second story, what are they doing when they get to the ridge cap? You know, what are the parts of the, of the roof that they're dealing with? Um, are they, when they tear off a roof, are they tearing everything off of there and replacing it? Or are they tearing off some things and replacing parts of other things, right? So for example, on a roof, you'll tear off turtle vents, like box vents. Um, that'll come off you do with the shovel, right? When you shovel the shingles right. off, you just shovel those vents off with it. Right. But for a furnace vent cap, you're not taking the, the vent stack off, you're just removing, you're replacing the cap, cap. and the guy's gotta get a screwdriver right and take that pop that thing off there and put a new one on right same deal with like sewer vent pipes right you don't mess with the pipe itself but but the boot that goes around it has to be replaced how do they do that drip edge right 
And, when, and then when the roof goes back on, you know, what's the order of operations? What goes on first? What, is, what does ice and water shield look like? Um, what does starter look like? People talk about starter, and if you've never seen it or you're not exactly sure what it is, it's, it's just a word, right? It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't, there's not a corresponding picture in your brain of what it looks like, how it was installed, why it's there. Um, and then I wouldn't mess with framing. Right to to start to to start learning this stuff because most of the claims you get as a, as a new especially on a cat side are finished surfaces right occasionally you'll deal with framing but you know it's going to be finished surfaces first and it's probably going to be roofs first next thing I would look at is our gutters what is a gutter why is it there you know what's its purpose if you know what its purpose is then it starts to make sense about why the downspouts are the way where they are you know why they're uh, why there's you know you won't, you won't see downspouts on the front side of a house for the most part why is that right aesthetics mostly but you know how far out are the runouts at the base of the downspout and why um, there's they they look simple and their function looks simple but there's a little nuances to them there's different materials for them there's different ways that they're installed there's different ways to keep things out of them a gutter screen, gutter guard, gutter helmet, leaf guard. Um, sometimes those are integrated into the, the gutter itself, right? Or they're attached later on to any gutter, right? Like a gutter helmet can be put on any gutter, but leaf guard is the gutter and the, the guard it's together, right? So learning about gutters, because you're going to pay for a lot of gutters. Millions of linear feet of gutters you're going to pay for. You know, millions, millions and millions. millions. And then so, and then how are those estimated? I mean, do you have to pay for downspouts separately? You know, when you look at Xactimate, you're not going to find a line item just for downspouts or just for gutters. You're going to see gutters <laughs> slash downspouts. Right. It's the same price for the de- for the gutter as it is for the downspout, and so you just pay. It's by the linear foot. You just add all that up and pop that number in, and you're done, right? Excuse me. So what's next after that? Fascia, right? So it's basically trim, decorative trim that covers up the framing, right? So fascia cover, so metal fascia or vinyl fascia will cover the the wood fascia that is that the gutter is attached to, and that's it's still kind of a decorative thing. Mm-hmm. You, you can have just wood fascia with the gutter attached straight to that. Then we're talking about siding, right? There's a lot of different kinds of siding. How is it installed? What's its purpose? How do you tear it off? How do you tear off different kinds of siding? What goes behind the siding, right? Um, windows, you can get pretty complicated with windows, but learn the basic types of windows because when you go to write an estimate in Xactimate, you're not going to, the window replacements are going to include almost all the things that you need for that. For the most part, there's some other things you may need to add to it, but they're going to cover all of the the shims and the this and the that that need to go with it. You may just need to add like a retrofit kit and like casing on the inside if you're replacing that whole window. Or maybe you don't, right? So look at how windows are replaced, not just how they're installed on a new house, right? Because you're not gonna be dealing with the the house wrap and things like that when you when you do a retrofit, when you, do, when you install a window, pull out an old window and stick a new one in. Like when you when you put a new one on, when you're looking at just the bare framing on the wall, you're gonna have like a there's a adhesive thing that you put around the opening, and, and then there's the house wrap and everything else so that it seals that in, right? So again, concentrating on the restoration side of things, the replacing everything. How do I replace a window? Not learn all about windows, right? Right. Um, and then for the most part. That's most things on the outside, right? You got some trim. You've got the roof, gutters, and siding, and windows. You know, you could probably go look at fence. How how what the different kinds of fence? You know, how are those installed? Look at decks, different kinds of deck materials. You know, there's plastic. You can get Trex. You can do wood. There's a bunch of different kinds of wood, um, but it's all square foot, linear foot stuff, right? These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays 
then write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. And then when you go inside the house, the things that I would concentrate on learning are going to be absolutely paint very first. How do you paint anything inside a house? Drywall or pla and plaster because you're going to still see plaster. There's still houses with plaster in them. Insulation because when, especially when you pull something off the ceiling, the insulation is just going to fall right out. Yep. Right. So you need to know how to, to deal with that. You need to know how to deal with trim and molding different kinds of trim and molding, baseboard, window casing, door casing, you know, crown molding, chair rails, all that kind of stuff. The most common thing you're going to see is going to be baseboard. You know, learn the different kinds of baseboard, you know, paint grade versus stain grade, right? Those are going to be the two main different kinds of baseboard. Floor coverings, carpet, it's huge. You're going to write thousands of carpet estimates, right? So learn the different, learn how to, Understand how carpet's installed. You know, there are a couple of different ways that carpet goes in, right? There's glue down carpet, which is just stick straight to a slab. Or there, most carpet you find in residential, especially in living areas or bedrooms, is going to be carpet with a foam pad underneath it. And then on top of some kind of underlayment and then on top of subfloor, right? So learn how carpet's installed, right? So have, watch videos of people tearing out old carpet and putting in new carpet and there's a bazillion you know flip this house videos and they're all i'm guarantee you they're all gonna be doing carpet in there yep. at, some, at some point so laminate flooring laminate flooring there's all different kinds of flooring so you have vinyl right there's vinyl sheet goods it comes in a gigantic roll you know it's old school linoleum as you see like in you know old mm -hmm. kitchens do you see vinyl tile you see vinyl planks there's all kinds of different vinyl like resilient flooring, right? And then there's basically three main types of wood flooring, right? So there's solid wood flooring, which is going to be probably the most expensive. And that's going to be oak, hickory, maple, chair, Brazilian. I saw a guy's house. He was a, a software developer for Microsoft. This was in Washington. And he his house, it was like a $3 million house. And he had Brazilian cherry. And it was ruined from... Like his 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 water maker on his refrigerator broke, and it was, I was like, the house is gigantic. Yeah, I had one that was a car dealer, and he had Brazilian wood, and the ice it maker. Was beautiful, and it was their, thousands. Their under cabinet ice maker. Yeah. Something broke on it while they were on vacation. Of course. And they come home and everything's it's just wrecked. Yeah. You, I've never seen such warped wood in my life. Yeah. So, and then you hear people talk about. Um, laminate wood flooring and then engineered wood flooring. What's the difference between engineered flooring, solid flooring, and laminate? And there's a difference, right? And then how do those all go together, right? And then what about cabinets? Because you're going to be doing kitchens and bathrooms, right? So how are cabinets measured? You know, what do they do? Can they just replace the faces on cabinets? Can you detach and reset cabinets? Can you save... If you're going to replace the lower cabinets, do you have to also replace the countertop or the backsplash? What do you do with sinks? It's cabinets over the flooring. C cabinets over flooring or cabinets that aren't over flooring? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, the Brazilian cherry wood, you know, floor in the guy's place, corner to corner, the whole place had it in there. Like, everything was, it was like the walls had it on it. They didn't, but they, the cabinets were. I mean, they were all, it was, anyway, so what do you do with 
the cabinets, if you have a water, you know, water damage to the floor on the other side of the, the room and the flooring goes underneath the cabinets, what do you do there, right? What are your options? What's an acceptable repair or do you have to pull all that stuff out, right? Um, and then in bathrooms, what do you do with those vanities? Like how are those, how do you even estimate those? Can you just, I mean, can you just go to Home Depot and just buy a whole vanity with the faucet and everything attached to it? Or well, how does that work, right? I thought you were going to say something. No. <laughs> and then. But yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can, absolutely. Or, you know, it may be a custom job where they, you know, they, right. they put their own, you know, you'll, you'll see in a lot of vanities, especially if you go walk around your apartment or your house, you'll see that the countertop has the, the sink bowl integrated into it, right? It's all one big piece. Mm-hmm. And then all these things that, that we're talking about, especially what we'll say on the inside, what if we just want to dry that stuff out and we want to, and it can be saved. It's not permanently like physically damaged. It's just wet. But if it stays wet, it will be ruined and we will have to replace it. What do we do to dry those things out? And for this, I strongly, strongly recommend getting, the what's it called the iicrc Mm -hmm. is that what it is um going and and taking there's water remediation training for this that explains explicitly in detail how to dry out structures and stuff right um that kind of training i absolutely it's it's specific to this go get that right um for exterior surfaces and and in particular roofs hague hague engineering hague hague education.com they have resources and training for being a roof inspector construction and all that kind of stuff um exactimate exactware has a a a program it's um so i think they put it together in the 90s maybe uh it's a little bit dated but it's called the ilx if you go if you do a google search for exactware ilx it'll come up with a link and it'll take you to it and you can still buy it. And it's, it's construction one-on-one and it's a lot of like how stuff is built, not how stuff is replaced necessarily, but it does give a good sort of primer on, on basic construction. Right. And it it also talks a little bit about blueprints and how things are measured square foot versus linear foot versus, versus squares. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, so, and again, YouTube, there's a lot of the problem with YouTube, unfortunately, is that anybody can put a video up about anything. So if you're looking up, you know, how do I replace a hail damaged roof? You're going to get a lot of like not necessarily true things about hail damage and things, videos made by people who are trying to influence people to spend more money than they probably need to. Um, I would say, but if if you if you dig. You can find resources on YouTube for um, doing home repairs, or, and which is what we're talking about, right? We're not talking about building houses necessarily. Um, books, again, Home Depot. Go to Home Depot, walk in there, and they've got a book rack. It's got all you know how to make decks, how to build cabins, how to build sheds, how to build this, how to build that. Basic wiring 101, basic plumbing 101, right? Those are good things to know. Because you may get claims where they have, it's not as common as the stuff I was just talking about, but they, you may have claims where lightning strikes a tree next to the house and zaps all the electrical in the, in the house, right? All the, I've seen them where the, the outlet uh, plate cover is exploded off the, the wall and stuck in the opposite wall, right? Little pieces of plastic and stuff. Um, because when the lightning hit the when it struck and, and you know zapped all the electrical, so those books usually they've got big you know big pictures in them and everything, and I think that those are probably good basic resources for that kind of stuff. Short of that, um, you can go uh, get a job on a construction crew. <laughs> you know what I mean? I will say that I feel kind of about that way the same way I do about going and becoming a staff adjuster just so you can get trained as an adjuster than to quit and become an IA. 
that person is th- that you go work for on a construction crew is probably a small business owner, right? A local business owner anyway. And then we're going to have to t- to train you. I mean, you're going to start off as a, as a job site laborer if you do the if do this kind of thing. And they're going to, you know, if you go work for them for a few months and then quit, then they got to go spend resources to go find somebody else to do that work. Yep. So I don't think it's fair to do to people to go get a job at one place just to, to learn something to, to go uh, to go work someplace else, right? Did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. Um, But... Short of that, what you could do is job shadow instead. And it may be more, it absolutely be easier um, to do a job shadow, not of a new build, not of, don't go to like a new neighborhood or a builder. I mean, you could, if you want to learn framing, do that for sure. Um, but I would shadow a water mitigation and water restoration company, a local company. Um, you know, shadow the, the, the tech at... The, the water mitigation tech or shadow an exterior restoration company like a roofer, a roof sales guy, or, you know, maybe at, t- talk to the guy and say, you know, can I sit there and watch your, for an hour or two, watch the guy, the installers doing this, that, or the other kind of work. Just go look, just go watch it. Right. And I, I can tell you that'll be a lot easier than, than job shadowing an adjuster because chances are with the adjuster, you're going to have to wait for there to be a storm before anybody's going to be out working. And then, you know, then you have to find somebody that will actually let you do that, which is not as easy as it may sound. Um, so with shadowing, uh, exterior restoration company or a water mitigation company, um, technician or a, a crew doing that kind of work, it's just as easy as just calling those companies, just cracking open Google and doing a, a search for those local businesses and just, you know, in exchange for something, you know, buying the guy's steak or giving a gift certificate to Amazon or something. I, who, I don't know, buy a, a coffee and just say, listen, I'm trying to be an adjuster. I want to be a good adjuster and I want to kind of go to the source, you know, to see how these things are done so that when I write my estimates, I can write better estimates based on reality and not on just me kind of guessing and, and poking through exact to make finding stuff that I think might go, should go in the estimate. Right. And I think that that's, if I was starting over, I would probably consider doing that first, I think. What about you, James? Got any ideas on this? Here, you touched on everything exactly what I would have said. Oh, I mean, right. well, that's the end I of mean, the that's, I mean, I, I worked at home restoration, you know, and, and that's where I got a lot of my knowledge as far as roof siding, gutters, things like that. Um, you, you don't get a lot of interior exposure um, because most of those companies are doing exterior restorations. Um, remodelers are probably a really good place if you can find one that will let you, I mean, just be honest with them. Say, look, this is what I'm trying to do. You yeah. know, if, I'll, if you need some help, I can come in and either volunteer to work for them and hang yeah, out volunteer. And, 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 you know, help them, you know, especially if they have a, a demo job, if they have a demolition job, a great way to learn how to build something is tear something down, you know? Yeah. And uh, and you go in there and tear it out. You open up a wall. You look at it. You know, and and it's fun. <laughs> you can be. You can, yeah. you can tear stuff up while you're learning how to 
yeah. you know, about how things are built and you can ask those questions and and trust me they, they enjoy having the help and you can learn a lot and it's yeah it's a win-win for everybody yeah. you know so um as a matter of fact i i actually did that i i knew a guy that was a remodeler and and there were some things I was curious about, and I was asking him questions. He says, well, I just happen to have a job. I'm about to go tear up, uh, tear out, and I can show you a couple of things. I said, well, let's go. And I never had so much fun in my life. Gave me a sledgehammer, and I just got to tear stuff up. Yeah, yeah. So got to be Captain Destructo. Yep, yep. <laughs> I've, d- I've done some construction um, in the off season. I've worked a little bit of construction for a guy who's a remodeler. And before I ever got into claims, uh, my dad had a construction company. And he built houses, and he also built commercial buildings, steel buildings. So I got to work on some steel buildings, which you find that you see more than you think that you would. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of steel buildings out there. And when I say steel building, what I mean is a building with a a steel frame that has metal, those metal panels on the side. And they can be agricultural buildings. They can be, I've seen them shops in guys' backyards in the suburbs. You know, guy will get a Morton mm-hmm. building. Um, they can be warehouse. So you frequently see them as warehouses or big garages or things like that. Um, a lot of buildings that don't look like steel buildings on the outside. You'll, when you go around and look at, on the inside, you see that steel, that free span steel frame. It's a steel building with brick on the outside instead right. of panels. It's good to know how those go together. I mean, we built, I, I can't tell you the number of buildings. Well, I can't tell you the number of buildings. Which there was a handful of them that my dad and I framed up together, just him and I, with a forklift, right? And then a crane. You hire the crane to come in after you set everything up. And this is like a 40,000 square foot building. They just, they, they, the whole thing shows up on one flatbed truck. Yep. And they, there's a, you get a big wrench or a couple of big wrenches. And there's a, it's, it's like Legos, right? There's an instruction book, step one put these pieces together and then put all you know do do that 10 times for all the the frames or whatever so but when you walk into those buildings like if you get the derecho claims yep. and you get a bunch of farm out buildings and you've never seen a metal building put together then you're going to be like oh, i don't know what to do right but it's any building is and it's supposed to be an enclosed space right so it's most houses buildings whatever they are mostly air right it's just the structure of the thing that's holding up the finished surfaces that encloses the space so that you can do stuff on the inside right it's people get intimidated by construction because they think it's there's science to it or that it's you know which there is, there is certainly yeah. but it's 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 still just a box yeah. right and it's mostly just air so i think if if you approach it from from that perspective and say all right well i'm going to take again take small bites of this i'm gonna start at the top and work my way down learn about composition roofing first learn everything that there is to know about how a composition roof is torn off and then reinstalled all the parts the order of operations again how long does it take right and i'll give you the answer to that one the biggest house that you can think of can probably be done in a day right any house in the suburbs they're going to tear that sucker off and replace it in a day and inside baseball, which you certainly know if you've sold roofs, the crews don't want to do 12 square roof houses. Nope. They want to do 35 square foot houses or square 35 square roofs. It's a day's work. Because they can one. do the, the whole thing in a day and it's not they're starting another job. It's like they can knock it out in a day. Yeah. Right. Tear off. The only time they want to do small roofs is if they're next door to each other. Yeah. Or they're all in the same. They're just jumping from house to house to do them. That's the only time they want to do small yeah. houses. This is why whenever a storm comes through neighborhoods that are that are smaller homes, nobody knocks on their doors. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the the nicer the neighborhood you live in, the more knocks you're going to get on your door. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 why sometimes it's hard to find a contractor that will go into the smaller neighborhoods. If you live in a ranch style home with a just a simple gable roof you get fewer phone calls you get fewer knocks on your door yeah than if you have this big old gigantic gable cut up roof that yeah you know and that's the but, listen I, I know that's true in dallas that's true everywhere yep hey, hey. mr insured how's it going it's going great today how are you doing <laughs> this is actually 
Guy Grand from Veteran Adjusting School. So you wanna learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the high-end training center Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in-depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come right along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. We, you know, we can we can shift gears here a little bit and kind of kind of talk about like complexity. Like, so a lot of times guys will hear guys complain about, you know, well, you know, I'm in this neighborhood and it's all mobile homes, or I'm in this this neighborhood and all I got is all all these little like 24, you know, 18 to 24 square roofs, right? And they're all s- small and there's there's it's all brick. There's no siding or anything. It's just they're small claims. And then they're complaining because somebody else is in a neighborhood that's got six hundred thousand dollar houses in it, and they're all the claims are all huge. I'm going to tell you right now, I want to be in that small neighborhood with those little houses because I can. I mean, you want to talk about ten claims a day? Yep. It's no problem, no brainer, easy. I mean, and we're because this is a volume game, right? Right. If the difference, let's say, for example, like the minimum, the average you're going to get on a on a any one of these claims average would be like 350, right? And maybe we'll say on the on the, the the low end. If I'm in that neighborhood that has you know the big houses in it, my average might be 410, right? It's not going to be that. It's not going to be a huge amount more per claim, right? If I can do, if I can only, and it's killing me to do it because there's so such big roofs. If I'm only doing five or six in that big neighborhood versus doing easily 10 easily i've worked in north st louis so many times and it's all just little one-story ranches and it's like it's so easy to just knock them out of the park they're so i know it's just you i'm gonna make more money and i'm gonna get more claims too because my my production is double what this guy is over over in the nice neighborhood i think that's another and i'm not fighting with contractors Exactly. You know, and the other thing is, is that a lot of people lose sight of. I mean, it's a, on the adjuster side, it's a numbers game. It's how many claims are you closing? Yes. And if you're, yeah, so you want to go to that neighborhood where you're going to get bigger claims and you make technically more money per claim if you're on a fee schedule. But if you're not closing claims, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter. And, and so, okay, so maybe you were closing you know, you were closing them at a good clip, but the guy over there that's closing eight claims a day and they're smaller, you know, he is making more money in the long run. Number two is yeah. he's he's getting noticed because he's closing claims, you know. Yep. And so whenever it comes time to look at, okay, who are we cutting and who are we keeping, who's closed more claims? Yeah. You know, the guy that closed more producing. claims are, is going to get to stay on the job longer. So guess what? He's out there working on that job another three weeks, making more money while you go home and figure yeah. out what you're going to do next. Or three months. Or three months, right. Yeah. And then, this is, this, so this is kind of how my career went for a long time before things changed a little bit with the companies I was working for, is they, the first two weeks, there's 25 adjusters there, right? And you're all over, they just, they're all over the place, right? If I'm producing and they start cutting people doing that you know the, doing the cut um if i'm the last guy on the storm if i started out in the neighborhood it was all mobile homes or it was all like cracker boxes or little mm-hmm. ranches or whatever by the by the time every almost everybody else is gone there might be like a one cleanup guy and one or two adjusters that are handling the new claims that come in and this is the long tail of a hail storm mm-hmm. this is why i like hail so much I'm in all the neighborhoods at that point because I don't have any more competition, right. right? So I'm doing the house, and it's not like I'm doing, you know, trying to smash out as many as I can on these giant houses every day because that's all that's all I've, that's I'm in that neighborhood. It's like I'm all over the place, so I'm doing one of those every couple of days, and you know I'm in 
I'm, I may be driving out here. I may be, I'm, I'm the guy that's going everywhere because mm-hmm. I'm the last guy. Because I can handle the claim volume at that point um, because if they got the big bulk of the claims taken care of up front and then the guy at the end just rides it out. And I want to be that guy at the end, so I'm going to do everything at the beginning to be the guy at the end, which means whatever they give me is I'm going to try and do it as fast as I can with the best quality and the best customer service that I can. I try to be the best. And honestly, it's not that hard. I discovered that if I put in 10% more effort that I could, that I was going to be working more than about 80% of other adjusters. I was you know, if you're average, you're better than 50% of the people. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if you're slightly above average, then it's, start, you know, the numbers start to work yep. in your favor. You know, you really have to push it to get into the top five or 10%, but it's still, it's just a matter of thinking through your processes. It's a matter of always reaching for, for respect, friendliness, and kindness first when you're dealing with anybody and trying to keep your eye on the ball, which is volume, right? If you do those things and you concentrate as much on those things as you do about trying to figure out where, you know, how to search for something and exactimate this, the technical part of it, you're going to be, you're going to do well at this job. Mm-hmm. It's not the, the, the field of adjusters out there we have a, 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 lot, a lot of variation and kind of inconsistency and because they're coming from so many different places with so many different trainings, right? And so many different experience levels. It's, it's easy to distinguish yourself, relatively easy, I should say, to dis- dis- distinguish yourself because, because a lot of times the IA firms throw warm bodies at things. It's easy to be better than the warm bodies. I guess I should say that. Yeah. I, I mean, that. well, I mean, let's go back to what I witnessed in the, in the, I just got my first iPhone guy. Yeah. I mean, the guy's like, I just got my first iPhone a couple of weeks ago. They expect me to learn this crap in three days. I mean, it, it just, <laughs> and the guy was serious. And, and and they expect me to. Let me tell you what, I have bad knees, okay? And, and I have a difficult time, you know, on roofs. This guy had a difficult time just walking through the, across the room, okay? Right. But he was there, you know? And guess what? He was still there when I left, yeah. you know? And, uh, yeah, so you never know, but it's just, it, just all you gotta do is just be better than the average, to, and just be a letter, you know, just keep improving, and you're gonna get there. I mean, it's just yeah. the the people, you know. I'm just gonna refer back to the one video. My biggest motivation for me to be good in this business was a video that I saw that you did. It says we suck. Really? <laughs> yeah. Because it, so you did that video, and then I was out talking to IE firms, and I'm doing my job. And I was already trying to do a great job because I understand the dynamics of doing a great job and what that means for you. And I had IE firms just extremely happy with me. And I'm thinking, well, you know, so I'm just doing my job, you right. know? And then you come out with that video, okay? And then I start asking questions to the IA firms. They go, James, you don't realize how much suckiness we put up with. You know, they said that probably 70 to 75% of the people that they deal with every day on every storm, dailies, everything suck. There's no detail, there's no customer service. There's, there's just, it's like they think that. You owe them the right. work that they're doing, you know, and, and they don't take any pride in what they do. Nobody goes above and beyond. And everybody's saying, well, hey, I've got one over here, seeing if you could do it. Well, that's a little outside my area. How much more are you going to pay me? Yeah. You know, or, and they just want to stick with some big thing. They go versus you, you'll look at it and go, hey, I'm really not going to be that far from there tomorrow. It's on the, it's on the outer edge of where I go. It's just beyond the outer edge where I go, but I'm happy to be close to there tomorrow. Yeah. I'll handle it. Yes. And I'll handle it for my regular fee. You know, that you do stuff like that, you know, and you get more work. And then guess what? When they have that really good gravy thing that comes up, whenever you have 23 school buses in one location, you get to bill time and expense for at 75 to $80 an hour, okay? And every bus has the exact same damage to it, <laughs> which means your parts research is very simple. You right. parts research one time, but you get to charge parts research on every single claim. You get those things. 
you know, by just going the little extra, you know. As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket? Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. And the thing about it is, is yeah. that it's, I, we're not meaning to like say that if you don't know how to use an iPhone that you can't do this job or that you right. suck. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying is, is that there, because I think, because we're independents, yeah. um, that there's a little bit of a mercenary attitude. Yep. And so like, it, what's in it for me? I'm out looking out for number one kind of a thing, which is, I think is perfectly natural. It goes against human nature a little bit to be like, show up to serve, right? Yep. So it's some, it's a, it's a, an a, like an attitude shift or like a, like almost like a worldview shift that a person has to like consciously do and then constantly cultivate in their character, right? In order to because it's not it's easy to backslide. I mean, I've gone I've gone on a diet two times this year, and I bit backslid both times, right? It's, yep. it's, I know what I need to do to be to feel better, to be healthier, or whatever. But I backslide because I'm you know, like, no, I'm not going to do that right now. You know, I'm just going to I'm, I'm looking out for my taste buds at this moment. I'm going to eat pizza and whatever. Yeah, right? Well, look at me. <laughs> Listen, you know, by the time this airs, hopefully I will uh, be sticking to my diet. So my point is, is that it's an attitude shift that I think needs to happen in our industry. It's not a lack of skills or all these people, most of these people that we're talking about, you know, when we say if I do 10% more effort than everybody else, I can be better than 80% of everybody else. Exactly. Right. But that doesn't mean that if everybody else put in 10% more effort, it would, it would be better for the industry as a whole. It'd be better, better for our industry, for our particular career. If everybody just was like, you know what, I'm going to not be in this for me. I'm going to have an attitude of service when they call me and they I'm the fifth person that they've called, um, trying to get a claim taken care of. That's a, it's a flyer. It's way out there. Right. With a smile, reassure that, that manager or that dispatcher, I'll take care of it. No problem. Just send it over to me. Right. Not negotiating mileage or how much extra this or how much, you know, how much more are you going to give me to, to help you f- fix a problem that, mm-hmm. that you are, you're starting to get anxiety about because you can't. Nobody wants to take it or they want to fight with you on money, right? If I'm the, the manager and I, this claim comes in from the carrier who I have a relationship with as the IA firm, the carrier's like, I don't care how you do it. Just solve this. I need, we have to take care of this claim. It's on me now to take care of the claim so that I can go back to them and say, it's, it's taken care of, right? So then I reach out to you and you say no or you fight with me on, on mileage or some t- nonsense or whatever or you're f- afraid that if you take it you're going to be the guy that has to do those all the time and you're going to lose money every time you walk out the door don't just go do something else yep. get out of here or change your attitude one or the other right because reciprocity is real I can tell you if I go and I, I go do a garbage cat for those guys, and they'll tell me, they'll say, listen, this is not a, this is not a good one. Yeah. We really appreciate you. If you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take care of it. We appreciate you taking one for the team 100%. Later on, they're going to send me off for 77 apartment buildings. Right? And that's all I got to And do. it's happened to me. It I mean, happens. It's, it's, I love it. It's, 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 it it's, makes up for it. It makes up for it. Again. It's I'm relationship go back, building. Go back to my school buses. Yeah, that exactly. Was a, that was a great payday. How many? Let me ask you this. So how many... Uh, flyer garbage claims that you have to do in order to get that. A couple. Couple. Yeah. Couple. It's not that common yeah, to I have mean, those it, those those far flung claims like that. Or they'll call you up and go, "Hey James, we have somebody drop us in the grease. I got to get this one done now." Drop us in the grease. Is that an auto thing? Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's, it is. It's a colloquialism. Yes, it is. You know, somebody else has dropped us. 
we got to get this done fast. How, how fast can you get to it? I say, how fast do you need it done? Just send it to me. I'll figure a way to get it done. You know? Yeah. And I'll figure out a way to do it. They're not arguing money. They're not arguing what it's going to cost them to do it. No. You know? I do it. You know, I'll put a note in it saying this is what I needed for mileage to get there, and they don't even argue with me. I just go do it because I took care of their problem for them. Yeah. You know? And you listen, you got to follow through on that. You can't yeah. just, like, say, all right, well, I'm just going to say yes to everything. And and you got to do it. Get, if you, you know? Because that, that, you, you have to take care of it in a time. Or manner. I'm just like, this has happened before. I was on my way back from fishing. Okay. I'm out in East Texas heading back towards Wiley. James, we've got one that's in this town. We need, can, how, when can you get to it? Can you get to it tomorrow? I said, send it to me. I'll do it right now. You know, because I carry all my stuff yeah. with me all the time. I was literally going to drive right through that town, you know. Yeah. And I got paid my, I got paid 110 miles from my house to there. And I was already there, you know, yeah. and, uh, and those things happen. I mean, they just, because if you, you're going to be the first person to call when they have a problem because you've always been willing to help yep. and, and you get those rewards. I'll go over and over and over. The more you say yes, the more opportunities you get to say yes. The more you say no, the less opportunities you get to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. All day Perfect long. Sense. And these guys sit there and go, oh, I won't work for less than this, or I won't go beyond this, or I won't do this. You know, well, I'll be honest with you. How'd you do in 2020? You know, when all these people right. sat around and complained that they didn't make any money until the hurricanes came around. And even then some guys didn't make that much because they got so picky about it. Okay. I'd really like to compare yeah. tax returns next year. I mean, I'm not trying to be cocky, you know what I mean? But it's yeah. just like these guys sit there and complain about everything, you know, and talk about how they'd run their business. And they'll call me on the phone. Hey, James, what's up? Well, I'm over here. You're out of town again? Yeah, I've been sitting home. They've been sitting home. I'm out working. Yeah. You know? So I'll just shut up on that one. It just gets on my nerves. When well, make yeah, excuses. it's true, though. The thing about it is, is that people will complain about fee schedules. Right or the percentage, the cut they're getting off the feet, the you know they're splitting up between the IA firm or whatever, or they're complaining about how much they're getting paid for photo inspections, all that kind of stuff. You give yourself a raise when you're more efficient. Mm -hmm. if, if I can do all that work, all those 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 pieces of that claim, which individually are not complicated, if I can spend less time doing each one of those things that I'm spending less overall time doing the claim, which means I close the claim faster. Yeah. It's, it's not, again, it's not, I'm not running around the house. I'm not, you know, speed talking. I'm not typing twice as fast as I normally do. I'm just doing everything at my normal speed. I'm just taking less time to do this. I'm becoming more efficient. If I close more claims, I'm going to make more money. Doesn't matter. I don't, I tr really almost don't care what the fee schedule is. As long as it's right C customary, reasonable, you know, typical, right. you know, for the, for the industry and the cut isn't if the, if the cut's less than 60 percent that's what it was it has been you know for most of my career and before that it was a little bit higher if it gets less than that then right that's that would work that's a point where I'm, I'm gonna start shopping and i'm not saying that i'm like the be all end all greatest ia independent adjuster appraiser out there that's what i'm saying i make mistakes and oh, lord knows i've made a lot of mistakes i've made mistakes where i'm just like man, this is going to come back and bite me. I mean, or I'll wake up in the middle of the night and realize I totally did that wrong. I totally messed that up. I missed that, you know, and, and I, but you know what the difference between a good adjuster and a suck adjuster is the good adjuster is going to, is going to acknowledge his mistake. He's going to learn from his mistake. And he's going to correct his mistake. Yeah. I got up the next, next morning I got up, I contacted, Hey, look, I did this. This is what it should have been. What can we do here? You know, yeah. and, and they're shocked that I called and called attention to a pro problem that I, I have that nobody at that point even knew about. Yeah. You know, just make the mistakes. It's OK, but don't sit there and act like, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody what they should work for. I'll never tell you that. Yeah. If this is what you feel like you should work for and you're not going to work for it, that's fine. You know, but if you're going to sit there and complain so much that your income falls below six figures a year, OK, because you're not working. But now you're worth less than six figures a year. Right. You're working, okay. doing less work and getting paid less. This is what you said your worth is now because you said, well, I'm not going to work for that. So I'm going to sit home. You went from making six figures to nothing. Right. Exactly. Okay. While I'm out there making six figures. Yep. Okay. So that's I think what I'm it, worth. Yeah. And I think it, like a, a really shortened like uh, way to look at this is 
a question that I get when hurricanes pop up. Hey, I'm on standby with these companies, and uh, I know that company A pays this much and company B pays this much more. Company B pays more. If company A calls me first, should I try to negotiate with them? Because I know, you know, or should I just say no to them? Because company company B might call me, and I might get paid more. I'm gonna say, until you're an experienced adjuster and you've built a relationship, and you're gonna go, you know who you're gonna go with. You're not gonna be on standby for anybody else. Until you get to that point, if you're brand new, go with the go with the very first one that calls that's, you. That's that's how you do it. You have to yep. because nobody else might call, right? And you know it may turn out later. You talk to somebody, you, make, you got friends with somebody that worked for one of some other company, and they say, "Oh, it was awesome. We got paid this much, and I got this many claims. Yada yada. And it was better than you did." So what? Yep. Right. It's it's it happens. I mean, I've I've missed hurricanes because I was staying on hailstorms, right? Yep. Are you new to the professional claims industry, confused about exactly how to get started as an IA, worried that the advice you're getting on social media might not be totally accurate? Then you need to check out IA Path. IA Path helps adjusters get started in their new career in 90 days with online mentorship programs and training. If you need help getting started or making a transition as an adjuster, head over to iapath.com slash adjuster TV for a free video course showing you how to get working in the next 90 days. That's iapath.com slash adjuster TV. It may be in the future that it's switched, right? And you, that's how you'll learn. Like maybe maybe company B was, is great. And it happened to me several times this year where I received a phone call I said yes, and literally within minutes or hours, another company calls me, offer me to go. It was the company I really wanted, I'd really much rather work with, but I'd already committed. I already yeah. told the other people, yes, I'm going. Yeah. You know, you got to go. You, you got to take it. You got to dance with the one that brung you. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and one company that I just love doing a lot of work for, um, I do a lot of dailies and, and special projects and things like that for this company. I have not done one deployment with them because they would always call me after somebody else called for a deployment. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, like, they're like, wish you, wish you just be a little more patient. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, that's not my best virtue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. well, and it may be, you know, it's, we're talking about pay and it may be that, that company A doesn't pay as well. Like the mm -hmm. carrier, the agreement that they, they came to with the IA firm mm -hmm. isn't as like a, as good as you know, company B, C, D, E, and F, but their process is super simple and their team, they got a small team yep. and they can give you a lot of volume and you can close claims quickly. I'm going with that company one because volume again, the less like minutia, like, you know, small work stuff I got to do, like having to do 59 steps for, to close a claim kind of thing. The less of that I can do, the better. Cause this is, it's also about a, a like a, a work experience for me if the, if the process is simple and I'm, I'm able to you know concentrate on good technical accuracy with my estimate and scopes and with great customer service and then close the claim quickly after that instead of getting bogged down in all the details and stuff i might be getting paid more but i might not be able to close as many claims as i can with these guys volume 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 so all, uh, well, on cat 100 yep. percent is, is volume. You got to close a lot of claims. You can't hang on to claims. So again, take care of your, take care of your business, you yeah. know, take care of, of your IA firms that hire you, you know, don't, don't be the prima donna, yeah. you know, don't be the prima donna until you can be the prima donna. I will tell you, I will admit that I made a mistake. Okay. I got real frustrated about a situation that I was in and I voiced it, you know, and I know that when I voiced it, I did myself no favors. Yeah. Okay. I, I absolutely know, but I was frustrated about a situation. There was no excuse for me to bring it up the way I brought it up. Okay. I should have just internalized it, maybe pulled one manager aside. But uh, I went, there was four managers standing around in a circle, and I went right in the middle of them <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and voiced my opinion. And, uh, and they kind of talked me off the ledge a little bit, you know, and everything. But, um, I'm sure that that immediately gave me a reputation as a complainer. 
You don't and want I had, that reputation. And at I all. had to and I had to come off of that. I had to do a lot to make sure that they understood that that was not who I was. Yeah. I, I realized when I walked away, it's like, oh, James, <laughs> why did you do that? You know, what were you thinking? Yeah. You know, and, and I and I feel like I recovered out of that yeah. pretty well because I ended up getting to do some things that other people didn't get to do. But Listen, <laughs> developing a relationship, and I will tell you, most IA firms that I've worked for, or all IA firms I've ever worked for, and most that I've ever heard of, are run by great people. Yep. And they all, it's, you know, they're all great companies. You develop a relationship with an IA firm, and you you fit into their, their culture, right? And they like you, and they like working with you, and you like working with them. You're going to move up, right? When they get... You know, when they they start needing more commercial work done, you get certified to work commercial for them, and then you get out of the residential, you know, little piddly wind claims. You're still going to do that stuff through your career, but then you move up a, t- a tier as you gain experience, and the pay may be way better, right? You know, so if you want to talk about pay, it may be, and again, you may be specialized in the condos or or whatever. You move, you can even move beyond that, and maybe a leadership position or, or something at those one of those companies, or you have so much experience with all this stuff and ha- have so many years in the field or as, as an acclaims professional that you become a general adjuster and then you can write your own ticket at that point, you know, a real general adjuster, not just like just adding GA to the back of your right. name, which is, you know, you gotta, you gotta earn that. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. And those people, you know, that's the, that's the guy that goes to Michael Jordan's house, right. his water stain on the ceiling kind of thing. Right. So, there's there's a, a progression and again we talked about it before the people at company a with a kind of okay fee schedule but the high volume who run that company may end up over here at company b right and may they may bring their like streamlined workflow ethos to this company with the better pay and then you slide over there right i mean it, who knows right this is it's a journey there's a lot of paths you can take and you're going to end up r- mostly in the same place but you have to network. You have to be willing to have an attitude of service. Be re- willing to relationship build. Take say yes when other people say no, right? Yep. And we got so far away from like learning construction, but you know, it is what it is. That's why we do this. So I had this one. I went out to you this insurance this house, and it was a hail claim, and. Yeah, it was roof gutters and some window frames on two sides of the house and, like, deck stain and, like, a, a grill. Pretty standard mm-hmm. issue, suburban hail claim. And the house was, I think it was probably around 25 square roof. Maybe maybe not even that. And I got out there, you know, this guy was super nice, you know. It was a, probably a three-year-old house, no trees in the neighborhood. It was a brand-new, you know, subdivision. And sitting in the truck, I write everything all up, and I go back out and stand there in his front driveway going over the numbers with him. And he starts to scratch his head, and he starts to give me a little bit of, like, kind of, like, his body language started to kind of, like, close up a little bit. And I'm, like, looking at him, and he's like, how much was it for the roof? Because my, my total estimate was, like, $11,000 or something like that. And I flipped through, and I was like, ah, I think I got, it's, it's 6500 for the, it's what? And he, he blew up on me, right? And... It wasn't a new neighborhood now that I remember this because he had replaced the roof himself and he paid a contractor Mm $12,000 to replace the roof. And he lost his mind because he thought we were paying half, basically half for the roof when we should have been paying 12 grand for this roof that he just bought a year ago. Right. And it was only the roof that he did. He didn't do the gutters. He didn't do the the window wraps or window frames or whatever. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, so I'm, I'm double checking my numbers and everything. And, and, uh, cause I, I, what if I made a, I could have made a mistake on it. Right. right? And it could be, you know, but I, I, it turns out that that was what it came out to was 6,500 bucks. I said, listen, I totally understand the, the, the most important thing here that we, we have to be concerned about is getting the work done. Right. It doesn't, it shouldn't matter how much it costs. So with that being said, Get an estimate, get two or three estimates from contractors, and if they all come back at $12,000, then I'll work with whoever you, you decide you're going to use on it, and we'll get it figured out, right? Um, but if 
you know, and we'll just go from there. So we're going to give you the money to go ahead and get started, keeping in mind and leaving the door open that I, I missed something I just didn't see. Right. I totally missed. Right. I'm totally just whiffed it. I got a call from him like three or four weeks later, apologetic. Right. Right. Because he's like, well, I went and got three estimates and, and one of them was $7,000 with the other two. One of them was, was 5,000 and the other, and then the, the one, the guy we're going to use was 6,200. He's like, I, I think I just got screwed and cheated when I had the roof done for $12,000. And I'm like, he's like, I'm so sorry. I, I yelled at you. Da, 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 da. And I was like, listen, totally understand. You know, I, 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 I feel your pain. I, 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 what do you say to that? Right? right. I can't remember exactly what I said to him, but it was, it was basically the, the whole point of this is, is people will pay. I've, I've had this happen more than once. It happened in New York. A guy, he had like an eight square roof and he paid $16,000 for it. Right? Oh, it was ridiculous. He's like, well, that's a $16,000 roof. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> you know, did they use gold line felt? Yeah. And then yeah. another guy in Seattle is $22,000 for this little roof and they wanted to finance it. And it was going to be like three or $4,000 in finance charges over the course of like a 15 year. I was like, I, I can't. I can't, I just can't. This is, it's, yeah. it's, it's stealing is if you ask me, right. contractors are some of these guys and, and I, I'm not painting a broad brush here because most contractors I met a lot. Stand up dudes. They're stand up guys. Honest as can be. And they're like, we just want to do the work for what the going rate is. And they work on volume too. Having done roof sales and that's, you yeah. know, you've got a, it's volume game, right? If you start getting bogged down and trying to fight on supplements and stuff, you're going to, you're not going to get the, the volume. So, but, but some guys out there will charge whatever they can get away with. Right. I, you know, and they, some of them say in business, other ones, I don't know. I mean, and it, this isn't a, like a bagging on contractors, but when this happens, there's, you, you have to make, the, let the customer reassure the customer that you're going to, you'll, you, you, you're leaving the door open to the expectation that if something changes for any reason that you're going to work with them to get it straightened out. I'm not saying don't ever say if it's more later, we'll pay more. Right. We used to, which you will if it, if it is, but you, but the first step before that is to review it. Right. We'll take a look at it and we'll get it figured out. We'll work with your contractor to make sure we, we pay the right amount, which is what is what I always say. Um, not, you know, making a promise that I can't necessarily back up or that I'm going to make the, the carrier back up. Well, your, your adjuster who came out and said, you know, they'll pay more if it's going to be more, right? The contractor comes with an estimate that's more then they assume that we're just going to pay it. Right. Right. So that's my one thing. So that's your one. So I have this one, another auto claim. The, uh, go to the house and knock on the door. Wife says, okay, one minute, walks back, hands me a piece of paper, and it has, and this is a hell claim, and it had all the dent counts, or her husband had counted all the dents. Oh, boy. And uh, uh, he said that this is accurate, and uh, and there shouldn't be anything different than this. And uh, I go out to the car. I look at it immediately, you know, it's my counter higher. I've got more. Also on there, they had the front bumper was loose. The front bumper was loose because the winds were really high and it blew the front bumper cover loose. Were they going down the highway? No, it was sitting in their driveway, but they had 50, 60 mile an hour winds that were so strong in that neighborhood that it blew the bumper off their car that's designed to go over 100 miles an hour. And I blew off. But, you know, they, they've got it on the Could list. Could happen. Probably not. <laughs> so I, mean, I, I write up my estimate. Well, the car's going to total. The car's a total loss because of hell. Okay. And certain states, um, just because a car is totaled by hell, it's an aesthetic total loss. Right. So, therefore, it's not going to get a branded title. Okay, oh. you, you you don't get a salvage title. Uh, you can buy the car back, keep it, repair it yourself if you can find somebody. You know, whatever you want to do, you can do. Well, I look at it, you know, and I did my estimate there on the spot, and um, 
I knew it was a total loss, but the guidelines were I was not allowed to tell them it was a total loss on this because there's a few other things we had to do. So two days later, husband calls me irate, just just really, really upset. I told you, I gave my wife that piece of paper and told you the didn't counts to tell you that those didn't counts can't change from that. I already knew what it was going to cost to fix the car, and I don't want the car total. I'm like, sir, I got to call it for what it is, you know. Right. But we don't want that car totaled. We don't want a new car. We can't afford to buy a new car. This is what I want. Well, they didn't say afford. They just didn't, you know, want right. to buy a new car, basically. And I was just, I said, well, you don't have to give it up. Well, no, then I've got a, a title that I can't, I got a car that I can't get insured. Right, right. I said, so, sir, let me ask you a question. So you wanted me to give you an estimate on this vehicle that would had less damage to it. He goes, well, I would pay the difference to get it repaired. You know, and uh, I'm like, I was like, well, you know, you can still, they go, well, if we do it now, you're going to total the vehicle. I'm not going to get everything I need, and I'm not going to have enough money to repair the car. You know, and I said, sir, you're going to get made whole. Don't worry. And you can still get the vehicle insured. You just have to get the dents fixed. You're just not going to be, nobody's going to pay for hell damage again, but you can still get collision insurance. And everything right. Else. Guy was just irate as could be. Um, writes a nasty gram to the insurance company that I did what he, like, I went against his wishes and that they're crooks and that I'm a crook and, and everything else. The guy ends up um, retaining the vehicle. He retains the vehicle. He takes it to get it repaired. Um, he's going to pay it out of pocket. He ends up with money back in his pocket even after retaining the after they pay the total loss and he retains the vehicle. He ends up with a little bit of cash back in his pocket. He takes it to a shop to get it repaired. The guy at the shop does a great job on the car, charges him next to nothing to fix it. I guess the guy had pity on him or something. He didn't. So the guy didn't pay that much money out of his pocket. The guy's got full coverage insurance on his vehicle now. Okay, and it was it ended up costing him less money than it was going to cost before. I forgot about this car, completely forgot about it. I'm sitting in front of this restaurant one day. Car pulls up next to me. I, you know, I'm sitting in the car. The guy gets out, looks at me, comes over the window, and goes, "Hey, just want to let you know, I'm sorry about that letter I wrote to the company." <laughs> he goes, "There's the car. It's fixed, and it came, ended up everything ended up costing me less than it was going to." Right. I thought it was going to cost, and and everything's good, you know. And I'm like, all right, man. <laughs> you know, that's so similar to your story. I got some guy that's really upset with me, and yeah. you know, and it all works out in the end. It, but the fact is, the guy had already sent his nasty letters off, calling everybody crooks and the yeah. insurance company crooks, and you know, it's like, well, you know, you should have been a little more specific or not even filed a claim, you know, right, right, exactly. at all. But uh, that's another thing. So a lot of people think there's this big myth that. Um, uh, if you, if they total your car because of hell, um, that you're going to receive a, a salvage title and it's going to affect your ability to sell the vehicle and everything else. Uh, the only thing that's going to affect your ability to sell the vehicle is the damage to the vehicle at the time you try to sell it. That's the only yeah. thing that's going to affect this um, in that scenario. So um, I'll be honest with you, if I've got an older car that I've got insured and they want to pay me for it and I can retain it and I put a few dollars in my pocket, why not? And I just... You know, if I'd have been paid for it, I just put liability on it. When it goes away, it goes away. Yeah. Hey, there, <laughs> there you go. go. All right. Oh, it's that time. Guess what? What? You didn't give me enough time to write some more cards. So pick a card, any card. Well, look at that. <laughs> Did you hear about the blind man who fell in the hole? I did not hear about the blind man who fell in the hole. It was would be, it was because he couldn't see that well. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.